happy to have you at uh, today's session of uh, the Victor Talks. I want to welcome you on behalf of the Virtual International Consortium for Truth Research and its steering committee. Victor uh, is an online community of scholars who, with an interest in the value and nature of truth. We welcome anybody with an interest in those issues. Our mission is to give researchers a platform to, for sharing their work with a virtual community of colleagues that's independent of geographical location and institutional affiliation, uh, to foster an environment of critical constructive feedback, to promote gender, racial, and in ethnic inclusivity among those working on truth, and to, support, and to support research in all areas of philosophy of truth, including but not limited to the nature of truth, the value of truth, alethic virtues and vices, verisimilitude and accuracy, and the importance of truth in social, political, and moral philosophy. We are supported generously by the Future of Truth Project at the University of, Conne of Connecticut Humanities Institute uh, with further support from the University of Waikato and the University of Alabama. Uh, I want to, before we get started, remind you about the existence of our social media presence under, uh, I think it's Victor, V-I-C-T-R group, in various, on all your favorite social media, especially if they are Twitter or Facebook, and uh, also about our mailing list, Victorel, uh, which you can subscribe to by emailing me or by emailing victorgroup at gmail.com. We'll be putting more information about that into the chat very soon. Why you're here today is for Jun Yul Kim talking about Frege on Logic, and uh, once we get started with that, uh, John Yule will have about 35 or 40 minutes for his presentation. And uh, then we'll do 35 or 40 minutes of Q&A. And at the beginning of that, uh, I'll remind you of our system for uh, getting you recognized to ask your questions. And let's all welcome uh, John Yule Kim for Frege on Logic, the truth value true and logic qua science, qua the science of truth. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, Frege on logic, the truth value true and logic qua the science of truth. Um, the content might be a little bit different from um, what I said in the abstract or something, but it, it's still on truth value true and, lo and, and logic. So um, several commentators like uh, um, uh, like uh, Burge and Ricketts claim that truth is an, um, an object for Frege, specifically that truth is a truth value true for him. So, you know, um, notoriously, Frege argues that um, the reference, sentences have reference, and the, sen the, the, the reference of sentences is a truth value, one of the truth values, the true or the false. And so these philosophers, these commentators, Burge and Ricketts argue, yeah, so the, 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 tr the truth value true as a reference of all true sentences is, is truth for Frege. Um, and uh, I have defended this reading of Frege's conception of truth in a recent paper. Um, so let us call this reading of Frege's conception of truth the objectualist reading. Um, and the, this talk is about this objectualist reading. Um, well, as you can easily imagine, you know, the objectualist reading encounters a number of challenges and those challenges, I mean, some of the challenges are so famous, like, like given by Thamet. Um, and one of such challenges concerns Frege's remarks on science and logic. Um, in thought, uh, Frege writes, all sciences have truth as their goal, but logic is also concerned with it in a quite different way. Logic has much the same relation, much as the same relation to truth as physics has to weight or heat. To discover truth is the task of all sciences. It falls to logic to discern the laws of truth. So this passage raises uh, some challenges against the objectualist reading. So first, Frege says here, um, all sciences aim at truth. Um, but if truth is an object, as, as the objectualist reading argues, all sciences aim at this object. 
that how can you make sense of the claim that there is a single object, all science is aim at, right? Um, that seems to be a weird claim. Also, Frege says, um, logic discern, discerns the laws of lo truth, thus logic is the science of truth, in a sense, in a substantive sense, indeed. But in what sense can logic be the science of a single object? Um, so the objectualist reading of truth in Frege ought to answer these questions, and that seems to be a serious challenge. So this talk aims to develop answers to these questions. Um, specifically, uh, I defend the following claims. First, to know that P, in other words, to have the prepositional knowledge that P is to have the non-prepositional identity knowledge that P is identical with the truth. Um, and from this, it follows that to acquire new prepositional knowledge is to expand the knowledge of the identity of the truth. Um, secondly, given now based on the one, I can argue the following. Um, given that sciences are major intellectual activities through which we aim to acquire new propositional knowledge, in other words, to expand our knowledge of the identity of the true, we can say that the true is the aim of all sciences. And logic is the science of the true in the sense that logic aims to expand our knowledge of the identity of the true when the true is the only object given to us. Those are the three claims I want to defend in this, uh, in this talk, okay? Um, so let me turn to the first claim. Again, to know that P, in other words, to have the prepositional knowledge that P is to have the non-prepositional identity knowledge that P is the true. And so how should we start uh, with knowledge in Frege? Um, so for Frege, the notion of knowledge is closely related to that of judgment. So in Sources of Knowledge of Mathematics, um, Frege says, yet I do not count the grasping of the thought as knowledge, but only the recognition of its truth, the judgment proper. So he is identifying knowledge with judgment, but it's a little bit like oh, I mean, it's, it's, it seems to be incorrect because knowledge is supposed to be a sort of epistemic state and uh, judgment is supposed to be an epistemic act. So this identification does not seem to be entirely correct. Um, perhaps what he means is the following. It is by judging that P that we produce the knowledge that P. Okay. So given that a central question about knowledge in Frege is, what is judgment, right? And throughout his entire career um, for Frege to judge that um, P is to acknowledge the truth of a truth bearer. And in his mature career, um, the truth bearer, a proper a legitimate pr a truth bearer is a thought. So in, in, in his mature career to judge that P comes down to acknowledging the truth of the thought that P. Um, well, you might notice this, uh, here we can see another challenge for the objectualist reading. How can you make sense of judgment qua the acknowledgement of the truth of a thought if truth is an object? Okay. This is another challenge of the objectualist reading must meet. Um, and an answer to this question is found in comments on sense and reference. It's an unpublished manuscript. Um, here he says um, about a case where we judge that an, ob an object falls under a concept. And falling under a concept is, is rather sort of a, I mean, can be translated into having a property in the contemporary term terminology. But I will just stick to the Frege's um, terminology here. So again, about a case where we judge that an object falls under a concept, he writes, to acknowledge the reference of the sentence O is P as that of the true is to judge that, um, is, is that it, to judge that all falls under P or just O is P, he said. Um, 
So what seems to be meant here is, in general, to judge that P is to identify the reference. So acknowledging the identity between the reference of P with the truth. So simply speaking, to identify the reference of P with the truth. That seems to be what Frege is pointing to. And this point is also confirmed by Begrischrift in Grundgesetze and the function and concept. So basically the mature version of Begrischrift. So in Begrischrift, famously, to write down the following, you know, the pun style P is equivalent to judging that P or asserting that P. Um, and in function and concept, Frege writes the following. By writing um, tan style 2 plus 3 is equal to 5, we are not just writing down a truth value as in 2 plus 3 is, is 5, but also at the same time saying that it, 2 plus 3 is 5, is the truth. Okay. So therefore, again, to judge that P is to identify P with the truth. So now P is the truth value of the thought that P well, it's basically what it refer what it what 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 P refers to the P refers to is uh, the truth value of the of the thought that P. So thus to judge that P is to identify the truth value of the thought that P with the true. In other words, to acknowledge the identity between the true and the truth value of the thought. And given that um, the true, the truth value true is, uh, is a obviously truth item. Um, this is how we, we, can, we can say, this is how we, Frege elucidates judgment qua acknowledgement of the truth of a thought while taking truth to be an object, uh, to be the truth. Okay, uh, let me check the time. Okay, all right, good. Uh, we are good. Um, okay, but wait, one might say there seems to be a possible objection. So, what is the objection? The objection says to identify P with the true is to judge that P is the true according to this interpretation, you know, the, you know, the, based on the objectualist reading. Um, to judge that P is to judge that P is the true. And this leads to serious tensions. But what are those tensions? So one tension we can immediately find out is the following. So, okay, according to the reading, I just su suggested to judge that P is to judge that P is the true. Now, to judge that P is the true is to judge that P is the true, is the true, right? So regress. And this regress, as you can see, will like, will continue forever. Um, what's, what's, what is even worse is that um, this infinite regress seems to be exactly the kind of infinite regress Frege is pointing to in his argument for the indefinability of truth. Um, so, and I have argued it set in several different places. Um, but anyway, um, but I mean, leaving that aside, I mean, already this regress seems to be too obvious and seems to be, um, seems to be vicious, okay? Also, Another attention is like also Frege repeatedly says that to judge or to assert that P, we do not need any special predicate. I mean, he, in his mature career, he emphatically argue, I mean, repeatedly argues that point like, like over and over again. Um, and the gist of his point is that judgmental or associatory force is not associated with any expression of language. It's not a component of language at all. So we do not need any particular predicate or like a copula, anything. Um, but however, if to judge that P is to judge that P is your true, we need a special predicate for judging, aka the identity predicate is the true. Right? So again, you know, Frege's 
if, if the suggested interpretation of judging is true, there is another tension here. So at least the two serious philosophical tensions here. Um, given these tensions, um, shouldn't we reject this interpretation? And my reply to this is, the, uh, is, is this. Um, the, the objection obtains only if to identify O1 with an object O1 with O2 is always to judge that O1 is O2. In other words, to make a judgmental identification between O1 and O2. So if, if, if an act of identification is always an act of judgmental identification, then the objection obtains. But if not all acts of identification are judgmental, and to judge that P is to identify the true with P non-judgmentally, then the alleged tensions do not exist. That's my reply. But what is the non-judgmental identification here? So here, here I, I will try to give some ideas about what non-judgmental argument uh, identification is. So consider the following speaker act of reference. Um, say Mary is my new colleague who works on philosophy of comics and say I miss her her name as Maggie when she first introduced herself in a conversation with a different colleague, I assertively order Maggie works on the philosophy of comics. And here, obviously, I'm speaker referring to a person by Maggie when I assert that. But whom? Right? The person I am intending to talk about is, of course, Mary. If so, it appears plausible that I am speaker referring to Mary by Maggie. That seems to be quite intuitive. Um, but we cannot capture the whole story by saying so. Because I am trying to use the sentence literally, my intention is partly to talk about the reference of Maggie too. Right? So I am talking about Mary, but at the same time, I'm talking about the reference of Maggie. So basically I am intending to talk about Mary qua the reference of Maggie. So how should we explain the situation? Well, the best way to capture the situation seems to be saying this. I am speaker referring to Mary by Maggie and thereby mistakenly in this case, identifying Mary with the reference of Maggie. And by SI here, we can say I am intending my assertion to concern both Mary and the reference of Maggie. And if you buy into SI here, my speaker reference to Mary by Maggie is a verbal identification of Mary with the reference of Maggie. However, it seems implausible to say that I am judging or asserting in this case that Mary is the reference of Maggie. So if that's the case, my speaker reference in this case is a case of non-judgmental or non-assertive identification. So I don't make any predication or judgment or assertion, anything. Um, I am not arguing for a conception of speaker reference here, but merely exploring the possibility of non-judgmental identification. You know, so basically what we have here is like, so how should we understand this act of like, speaker reference and then I said like this, uh, this is the act of identification, especially non-judgmental and non-assertive. But in what sense? I mean, there can be further, further, uh, there can be further and further questions about it. But it's not my intention to engage with those questions here. Um, all I'm trying to do is sort of the sketching an idea of a non-judgmental identification. Um, and indeed, my speculation here does have a strong predecessor, Ruth Millikan. So Millikan suggests the non-judgmental conception of identification. According to her, the act of identifying, um, even when performed with language, um, cannot be that of making an identity judgment or an assertion. So according to her, um, there is nothing like identity judgment or assertion at all. Although there is an act of identification. 
Again, it is not my intention to defend the Millikan's claim. What matters is that Frege definitely needs such a non-judgmental actor of identifying for his conception of judgment. Um, as we have already seen, Frege elucidates judging that P as identifying the true with P. If judgment is not non-judgmental identification as we have sketched right now, Frege must encounter the tensions the object mentioned in the objection we are talking about. It's, so it's not just the tensions of the reading I have suggested. It's Frege's own, Frege's own problems, because he is clearly saying that judging that P is identifying the true with P. And elsewhere, I argue that like uh, Frege seems to apply, uh, is applying the notion of non-judgmental identification to the notion of judgment when he elucidates, especially when he elucidates judging as taking a step from a thought to its truth value. But I don't want to go to the detail for now. I mean, we can talk more about it in Q&A. Um, so here, let us just say that um, for Frege, to judge that P is to identify the true with P non-judgmentally. Then an, implica uh, an implication of this is that the prepositional knowledge that P is the non-prepositional knowledge of identity that P is the true. So, so we are getting into our main claim here, finally. Um, so here is an argument. So first, judging that P produces the non-prepositional identity knowledge that the true is P. Why? Well, an act of identification obviously produces identity knowledge. Um, thus, judging that P produces the identity knowledge that the true is P. Recall here the propositional knowledge that P is produced, produced by judging that P. If the identity knowledge produced by judging that P is the propositional knowledge that the true is P, then judging that P amounts to judging that the true is P, in other words, an act of judgmental identification. However, the identity knowledge produced by judging that P is the non-propositional uh, identity knowledge that the true is P. Um, oh, sorry. So, Ah, right. So the po point is, I, I think I accidentally skipped the one, 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 one step here. So the last step here is, by definition, judging that P is supposed to be, it, 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 it is, is to be a non-judgmental act of identification. Therefore, we come to have a contradiction. So we need to... Um, say uh, the identity knowledge produced by judging that P is the non-propositional identity knowledge that true is P. Okay, that's, that's the argument. Sorry for that. Um, then now the non-propositional identity knowledge that the true is P is the P knowledge, uh, propositional knowledge that P. Why? Well, judging that P is producing the propositional knowledge that P. Um, so what is produced? produced by judging that P is, but as we said, what is produced by judging that P is the non-propositional identity knowledge that the true is P. Therefore, the propositional knowledge that P is the non-propositional identity knowledge that P, the true is P. Okay. So again, the, proposi the propositional knowledge that P is the non-propositional identity knowledge that the true is P for Frege. Um, note that this non-propositional identity knowledge is distinctively objectual knowledge. In other words, knowledge of an object that is not reducible to propositional knowledge at all. Um, for Frege, this objectual knowledge of uh, identity is more fundamental than propositional knowledge, given that he elucidates judging the act of producing propositional knowledge qua producing the objectual knowledge of identity. Um, okay, so that's the first claim, uh, my argument for the first claim. All right. Now then, um, let us go back to our questions. 
First, how can you make sense of the claim that there is a single object all sciences uh, aim at? Well, by scientific investigations, we produce new propositional knowledge. When we produce new propositional knowledge by judging, what we produce is in fact non-propositional knowledge of the identity of the truth. Thus, we can say the following. Given that sciences are major intellectual activities through which we aim to acquire new propositional knowledge, in other words, aim to expand our knowledge of the identity of the true, we can say that the true is the aim of all sciences. So that's the second, my argument for the second claim. Um, now, the last claim about logic. Secondly, how can you make sense of the claim that logic is the science of the truth? Okay. Um, again, the answer I want to suggest here is logic is the science of the true in the sense that logic aims to expand our knowledge of the identity of the true when the true and the false, basically truth values, are the only objects given to us. Um, so for this, we need to look into a little bit into uh, the structure of Begrushrift, Frege's Frege's logic. Um, so Begrushrift starts with logical laws, um, which Frege takes to be indubitably and evidently true. And so, so, so they, he takes, to, takes those laws to be the indubitable and evident names of the true. Well, that might be a little bit incorrect because laws are supposed to be the um, thoughts, not the, but anyway, um, uh, that's that. And then from these laws, we proceed to other names of the true via inferential rules and definitions. Here, one thing we should notice is that we do not need to know any other, any object other than the true and the false in order to recognize the truth of the logical laws. Um, one might immediately raise an objection based on the law five. What are you talking about? You know, law five, the notorious law five talks about the, the objects of value ranges. Um, value ranges are objects that like they derive from the functions. Um, so, so the objection is to recognize the truth of the law five, which introduces the condition for the identity for value ranges one ought to antecedently recognize value ranges and then have intuitions or observations about them. Um, so, so, so in order, to, so my claim, basically my claim here, uh, here, logic is the science of the true in the sense that logic aims to expand our knowledge of them. When the truth, the true and the false are the only objects given to us is wrong. That's the objection, okay. But I argue to recognize the truth of law five, we do not need to recognize any object except for um, truth values. All we need to, uh, even, even truth values, maybe truth values, but all we need to recognize is a function. So that's exactly what Frege says in Grundgesetze. He says, if one function of first level with one argument and the second function are so constituted that both always have the same value for the same argument, then one may say instead, the value range of the first function is the same as the value range of the second. We then recognize something in common, both functions. Um, and this uh, we call the value range, both of the first function and, uh, and of the second function that we have the right so to acknowledge what is common and that accordingly we can convert the generality of an equality, the material equivalence into an equality, an identity. Um, uh, right? So it must be regarded as a basic law of logic. Okay. So here, Frege is saying that if we recognize functions that always have the same value for a given argument, we can recognize the value ranges of those functions and their identity conditions. That's all we need to know to recognize the truth, the truth of law five is a function. 
As soon as we recognize truth, value, uh, truth values, however, we come to be able to recognize a function. For instance, if we recognize truth values, we are already in the position where we can recognize the function such that it yields the true if the true is given as an argument and the false otherwise. Um, and in fact, that's, a, that's the function uh, referred to by the horizontal sign. Um, so thus, if we recognize truth values, we are in the position where we can recognize the truth of the law of five. Thus, all it takes to, for us to be able to recognize this truth is to recognize truth values. So we can recognize the truth of logical laws if we recognize truth values. Objects other than truth values can be introduced into logic only if their existence can be known solely by recognizing truth values, just like value ranges are. Therefore, logic examines how far we can expand our knowledge of the identity of the true when the true and the false are the only objects antecedently known to us. No other sciences are like logic in this sense. We cannot recognize the truth of the laws of other sciences only by our recognition of truth values. We need to recognize other objects and other things, uh, property and things like that. Therefore, there is a substantive sense in which we can say that logic is the sole science of the truth. Although all, so although all the sciences aim at the true, logic has a very special sense in which it can be called the science of the truth. Thank you. Thank you.